All right, I'm pleased to be here today with Julio from Snappick. Julio, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you um, for having me. We've had a lot of chats, uh, especially during the pandemic time. Uh, I don't think I've ever really dug into the origin story of Snappick, of you. Um, so I'd like to get into that here, if you don't mind. How, how did you get pulled into the event industry first before we get into Snappick? Um, so originally, it started off myself and Rosella, which is one of the um, four co-founders. So it's myself, Marco, Ray, and Rosella. Um, we started off in the events industry, just doing events um, for corporate clients and stuff. Basically the same way now, photo booths, um, like a bit of registration, that sort of thing. Um, and but we you, were, to, you were working for a different company. You didn't have your own company. Yet. No, no, we started our own company. You started your own photo yeah, booth yeah. company. So we had our own photo booth company and we did registrations as well. How did you find the photo booth opportunity? Um, so actually a strange thing. So when, I mean, I've always kind of had that like entrepreneurial spirit. My wife, um, her father was the same way, um, mm -hmm. entrepreneur. So she also got into that. Um, and by the way, my wife, Rosella, is my wife as well <laughs> and my partner. Um, and yeah, basically we were like, we, we were obviously clubbing a lot. Like we'd go out to nightclubs and stuff. And we thought there was an opportunity to put in those big advertising screens at the time in South Africa, because that kind of wasn't a thing. Um, and we thought like we needed to kind of add something to that, like have a bit of a different experience. And we would like, we'd see photo booths at places, um, and we'd actually done a couple of photo booths, like we built our own one when we, um, we were kind of like still in school, uh, mm -hmm. myself and my friend. So we're like, well, why don't we try integrate kind of like a photo booth experience? And then we can put that into nightclubs and then have kind of a photo experience, but then also branding. Um, so that was how it started. That's how so, it started. Like usually people get there, they start with just regular parties. Uh, but you started yeah, right away yeah. with the branding yeah the so bars. we wanted to we tried to sell that concept but like the club the nightlife in south africa is a bit of a, like a bit of a like an under underworld sort of thing mm. and i just didn't want to pay for that sort of thing um so the idea started with that um we actually approached marco and ray who had their own software development company mm -hmm. um and i'd actually gone to school with marco um and i knew they were like brilliant um, at what they did so I was like we, we got them to start developing like the software for that um, the idea obviously didn't end up working um, but then it evolved into us by some miracle we got like an event for one of the big banks and we started using those same units that we had had like shipped in from China and like built and developed the software and everything we had we used those for events and then that kind of just like pushed us into doing these like photo booth events, but more for the corporate clients. Hmm. Um, yeah. So you you initially were going for those bars. You started building a software for that. You got yeah. the equipment for that, and then you pitched them, and they didn't want it. And then somehow well, they wanted it, but they wanted they it for like free. Yeah, they, they were like, no, we're not going to pay for it. You guys can get the branding, the money from the sponsors, the ads from yeah. the sponsors and stuff. And that also just was a nightmare to do. So, this, is there any lesson there, like? Would you have done that differently? Would you have sold them before you started getting everything ready? No, I mean, potentially there was other ways we could have done it. But I think the lesson is that as long as you can pivot, mm -hmm. and that's obviously, I'm sure something we'll dive into with COVID. As long as you can, you can like and kind of be light on your feet in business and like pivot to something else and not just kind of be like, oh, okay, now what do we do? This is over. And then kind of like call it and having all the money lost and all the time spend loss so i think it's just about that like trying to do something different pivoting and trying something else seeing you know if something else works so i want to i want to ask you too about ray and marco they already had the development agency you said they were brilliant i'm sure they could have done anything how did you sell them this opportunity um so that's interesting like rose and myself um we were doing well then um, in terms of like the corporate side with the events, um, we also went into kind of event registrations. Uh, that was also doing really well. So we could essentially finance, um, like bootstrap the development with Marco and Ray, and it'll allow them to kind of step away. And they obviously saw like the vision with, with where, like what we wanted to do. Um, and they saw the potential because we were obviously, you know, doing quite well with the actual event. So like, you know, if we could sell this to, other people, um, you know, and kind of build up their businesses, that's revenue mm -hmm. we could get from, you know, like, like at scale mm -hmm. with like hundreds or thousands of users as opposed to just doing like one event. Um, I think they're in a similar situation with, with that, like doing 
events for people and being on the ground it's a lot of work like we have so much respect for for our customers because rose and i did it for years and it was it was taxing it's it takes up pretty much like the whole day yep. whole weekend you you don't do like anything but events because the times that you you're going out and having fun is when you now working so right. um yeah so that and then marco and ray had the same thing where they were developing for their customers you know they were building stuff for other companies that were making money and they were just getting this like one off right project based project based fee and and they also wouldn't you know they didn't see that as being sustainable so i think that's kind of where they where they saw the synergy and yeah we just all decided to kind of take it on together when you first started doing these events um what did you see that made you say we got to build our own software why didn't you use something that was already there um, and I don't know if you built your own booths too. Like, why didn't you use things that were already there? So the one challenge was we were obviously in South Africa. Um, we didn't have access to any of the, the hardware from like the States and, and anywhere in Europe or anything. Um, so we had that challenge where we didn't have access to the hardware. We were using the software and that was kind of the issue and it not, not necessarily with the software, but more the platform um, in our minds, like Windows. Mm. We were the, like, and we, we talk about it with our software, like, you know, you get to an event we, and we've spoken about it now at the show, you, you refreshing the iPad and you, you in, you know, you can start the events. If there's an issue, you can kind of like just close the app, start it again or whatever. Uh, it's, it's easy, it's, it's quick. Um, you can make changes online and it syncs to the iPad. Um, it's all, you know, queues offline. And like what we were finding was we would be at events using Windows based like solutions and then Windows would just reboot. It'd be like hundreds of updates. The and update that takes eight hours. Yeah. yeah, and the, like no, uh, yeah, just uh, just a minute, just five more minutes. We <laughs> we're just getting set up, and then like thirty yeah. minutes later, it's still happening. So we were like, we can't do this anymore. Um, and yeah, that's kind of when the iPad was taking off. We were we've always loved Apple, so we were like, you know, so it's more about something going something in, into the Apple direction. Yeah, versus okay, interesting. Okay, so then you started building the software for you guys to use. Um, take me through the next steps of SnapPick. Like you were using it, you battle tested it. Uh, at some point, I guess that went to a product you can launch to other people, or did you use it for a while first, and then you said, "Let's sell this to other people." So we did use it, but we actually kind of we were building two platforms at the same time. So we we're building a registration platform because that's also what we're doing well within the event side of things. And then we're building out the, the photo booth platform. Um, and we gave it to people to start using. Um, and we actually came and launched it here at the show. Um, and it did really well. Um, the registration platform? or the, No, no, the, the, the photo booth. Now. Yeah, okay. yeah, the, the Snapchat Did you platform. ever have a question when you were doing both? Like, were you always... So we never got the, the registration platform to a point that we could then sell it. Mm. Because you saw the potential more here. Um, yeah, exactly. We we saw the potential with with the photo booth platform, and there were quite a lot of big players um, in the registration side of things yeah. that had already gone like massive funding. I think the one company got like fifteen million dollars or something. It was crazy. So we're like, there's no point in going down that road um, when we found like a really nice niche. Did you uh, have the intention from the get go to sell the software, you know, to other boothers? Or was it something where people saw it and said, hey, can I use this? Or did you from the get-go say, I wanted to build this to sell it to everybody else? Oh, yeah, no, it was always, we wanted to do like software as a service. That's kind of what was... And you knew the industry the was big enough? Like there was a big enough opportunity at that time? I don't remember. Um, <laughs> so, uh, that's it, that's kind of the thing we didn't. We 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 kind of thought maybe there wasn't enough of a, a market. Um, but we were like, let's let's test it out. Let's see. Because right, I, I don't happens. remember the exact year, but... Um, iPad boots were kind of like everyone was like, "Oh, it's a fad. I don't know. Is it going to be something?" And then, and then quality. They were yeah. complaining about quality. But then it took off like yeah. crazy. So, did you see that coming, or was it kind of like a question? Was there a risk? I think it was a risk, but it was more calculated in our opinion. We would always say this: like it was calculated risk because we knew what we had was a, a really stable platform um, with iOS and the iPad, and we we kind of knew like. You know, if if it was going to be the evolution of photo booths, it's m m most likely going to be on the iPad because it's going to continually evolve, which is what happened now. Yep, yep. You know, the camera gets better every year, the processing gets better. And, you know, iOS offer, like Apple offer through iOS, like awesome tools, an awesome platform, you know, for us to do cool things like um, we've done now with, with the platform. 
do you um struggle like are you a developer i assume that no, you're no. not so do you struggle with communicating with ray and marco or do you understand enough about programming to like i mean i have a very basic grasp um of programming so we i kind of leave you know that in their hands and they have more than capable hands like they've shown they've just the, the platform's incredible um and yeah we've just kind of yeah put it in their hands and all right so it, it it's people see something like snap pick it's a, it's a force in the industry um but there's a long path there right so i'm sure there's obstacles and challenges you've had along the way i think i remember an incident um where there was like downtime or something happened so can you talk to me a little bit about it's not easy there's challenges and how you overcame them yeah so uh, it was in 2018 um we had an issue with our with our servers um and unfortunately it was our provider um and obviously that then reflected badly on us um and since then we've had like incredible uptime it's been like 99.999 odd percent um but like that was a massive thing for us because you know I, I was sitting on the phone with people you know apologizing and it was really rough but yeah we got through it um it, like I think the hardest thing for us is kind of how it affected our users I know it's easy for us to kind of say that but it, it was because like we had all these big users we, we even knew personally like we'd been you know at the show with and we'd gone out to dinner with and we'd you know kind of affected their business so that yeah. it, it really hurt like it was that was a really hard time for us um, but yeah I think we overcame that and we've now provided in our opinion what is kind of the most stable uh, like platform on the market and we we strive to 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 achieve that like you know day by day just making it better and better and better yeah i think it's you know th things go wrong even the boothers watching listening know that they go to events sometimes things go wrong uh your client may get upset but it's often important how you respond yeah so you got better you improved it and that that's why people came back right so i think the way you respond to those moments is what re what really matters and what stands out because they're going to happen no matter yeah. what you do no matter what industry you're in those moments will happen how do you respond um one other thing that i'm curious about from you is that i know that you speak to a lot of customers i know that i've spoken to you a lot uh, you have a huge user base what have you learned from your customers because you have event experience too what separates the people that do really well from the people that can't get to the next level um i've actually spoken like in depth with a lot of a lot of users on this and i think it's something that we are going to work hard at this year to us uh, uh, kind of like promote more of you know how to kind of take yourself to that next level have a different mindset and i think like photo booth marketing now <laughs> yeah <laughs> sponsor there but like yeah they they are going to be providing you know tools for our customers ways in which they can like you know take themselves to the next level because i think everyone has a a problem with actually like marketing themselves and, and identifying you know how do i tell my customer that i can do this yep. how can i create this experience as opposed to just like oh i'm gonna you know provide a booth for a we for a wedding or birthday which is perfectly fine like those events like you can make lots of money on those events but it is actually easier doing a bigger event like you've seen it online i'm sure with a couple of the users they're doing corporate events they do one or two a weekend and they make a boatload of money and they don't have to worry about doing just hundreds of events to make the same amount of money right. so yeah i think changing that mindset to focus on giving a quality product service to a customer that's more of an experience as opposed to you know just trying to you know lower your price and get as many customers as possible it's i totally agree with you and something i'm passionate about too is the educating the industry because everyone benefits when you raise the bar the boothers make more money the clients are happier because they get cooler stuff the vendors make more money because their clients are successful so it's like a a cycle of success if you raise the bar for everybody um, yeah talk to me about the covid period because obviously like you said it affected all of us it affected me affected you guys um we were speaking a lot during that time what was that like uh for especially for a business that relies uh, on yeah. events like you know that's not easy mm -hmm. so what did you learn what happened how did you overcome it uh, any anything you can share there so i mean I, I, we obviously just spoke about the the our, like our server crashing in 2018 and that was difficult 
but we, we could have, like you said, we had a solution, right? We moved our infrastructure over to Amazon and we, we you know, hired someone to build out, you know, a whole system and make it super solid. So we had an option, right? Yeah. COVID, there was like no option. We were just dropped, you know, within a week, just down to, I don't know, 98% of our revenue just wiped off the table. Um, and we obviously had users which we could understand like losing their business and then what they were coming to us like you know can we have a refund and then we you know, we sitting in a position like if we go refund everyone that's it we are done like yeah. we will not make it out of this right so there was no there was kind of we felt like there was no way out at that point um especially if this lasted really long which we're sitting here it lasted yeah. longer than i thought it would <laughs> longer, exactly longer yeah. than, i mean we had spoken about it and i think this goes past what we had even thought was <laughs> well, like our was worst case be. scenario yeah. this is longer <laughs> yeah so look we pivoted into the the virtual booth and that helped us kind of get out of that phase um and and it was it was good and it was bad in in our minds it did take focus away from our product we could have been adding and working on the features that we really wanted to that we were like kind of passionate about and we unfortunately had to build out the virtual side of things and i think it did take away because what we've got now is everyone that said virtual was going to be big and they've just come back and and i know a lot of people have done well with virtual but it, it wasn't really worth it for us um like the amount we'd put in so yeah it's it, unfortunately it happened and and we've 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 got another kind of part of the business now um that we can utilize and and our customers can utilize but yeah it was also a challenge because it didn't actually pan out but it helped um, you survive you're saying and it helped us it did it help us survive. Survive. i'm sure yeah. the people that benefited from it you helped them survive too yeah um what did you so in your role obviously you have a good perspective on this what did you see to make you think there's nothing going the virtual way is not the way to go let's stick to this because some people it's, it's something i struggle with all the time some people are crushing it with virtual yeah a lot of people don't get it a lot of people tried it and it didn't work what did you see to say i'm not going this way i'm going to go back to this thing yeah so i think yeah we just like to look at the data and the data was telling us that people were at this as soon as things had opened up in a certain state or country we could see that trend, you know, moving straight back into in-person. We had users say, you know, we, we love the virtual stuff, but, you know, the second it was in-person, they, they were like, no, we don't want this. We want the in-person stuff. There is definitely a space. There's the hybrid sort mm. of thing where, you know, you're running a conference and you can have people from around the world have, you know, their photo integrated into the whole system and they're sitting in, in their living room. So I think there's, there's definitely a place for it. But, yeah, we just saw the signs... Um, I think just like kind of in the data and what the feedback we're getting from our customers that in person was just where we social beings, right? Yeah. Like how good is it to be back oh, it's great, man. with people <laughs> yeah. and, you know, seeing old faces and having conversations, having dinners. Like, I think that's what humans are all about. So that virtual thing in my mind was never, I mean, we spoke about it. Yeah. I thought even kind of working from home and stuff, it's great, but you know, you're not getting that interaction with other humans. And I don't think it's good for anyone's mental health to just be sitting at home by yep. themselves on, you know, like just uh, like looking at a PC Zoom, screen. Zoom calls yeah. nonstop. So if I had to ask you for a gut reaction from what you've seen so far, you don't think the virtual, if people are, are watching this and trying to think about what should I do this year? Should I go do this? Should I go do that? Your advice is that you don't think there's a big opportunity in virtual for most boothers. Yeah, I think for most boothers, probably not, because it, it takes a lot to 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 drive that concept to yep. a customer. Like, and and you would need a target. I think we've seen success for people in the corporate space um, with virtual, but you really need to know how to sell um, that concept, and it, it's a tough concept to sell. Um, but again, I see the hybrid space. Like, don't completely ignore virtual. Yeah, just integrate it into an in-person experience, so you're getting a bit of both. Yeah, I mean, the, for the COVID, obviously it affected a lot of people in different ways. Uh, I know, fortunately, in America, people got help. Um, I got help. A lot of my, my peers got help. But everywhere, it wasn't like that. So can you share uh, from that perspective how it was for Snappic as a company? Um, yeah, so it was quite difficult. We, I mean, we'd been to the, we were here at the expo. Um, and then, you know, my partners, Mark and Ray, went back to SA um, myself and Rosilla went up to Canada and we actually got stuck there. But we hadn't set up, you know, in the UK or anything. So we didn't have any 
um, business there yet. Um, and so we had only the South African entity and the government, obviously, you know, the South African government, like, well, the country's not doing so well. So they didn't have any relief, like, for businesses. Um, so we literally got, like, zero. Um, and that almost, like, crushed us um, because, yeah, we we had hired new staff and we were kind of... And, I, I mean, that's just, like, a testament to our staff. Um, they all took a salary cut, Um we didn't actually end, um, lose anyone in the early stages because of that, because they all, hmm. you know, kind of took a massive salary cut um, and stayed loyal to the company. Um, some left at the, you know, kind of the end of that that 2020 period, but for other reasons, um, which we understood completely. But yeah, it was that, that's it was something devastating. People don't think about because um, every country's got their own. I remember it's not even just like in America, they gave loans to companies. People got unemployment, I think Canada too, and I'm sure some European countries as well. Um, but on top of in South Africa, not getting support, I think I remember talking to you and there was other restrictions. Like you you have to pay people a certain, like I don't remember the exact details. Yeah, so we got like, we did get a bit of um, the, the, like our team got some unemployment UIF, like they got a bit of, but I mean, it was nothing. <laughs> it was very low. Like we still had to cover um, most of it. So or, and I imagine right before that, you probably built your team up, you invested yeah. into the new structure, and then you get hit with this, and you have to support the whole team with no new money coming in. Yeah, and the thing is, our infrastructure on AWS, that's that's set. We can't yeah. reduce it or anything There's no like refund? That. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that money just keeps coming off every month because, you know, we're storing everyone's, like, um, videos, photos, events, all constantly. It's not like we delete. It's only We only delete it after, like, two years. So that data is sitting in AWS and any movement or any activity, we were still paying. So like we could just like so for all the, the boosters like, and then just turn it back on. So all the boosters that were like looking through photos during the pandemic, yeah. it cost <laughs> you money, man. It cost money, yeah. Um, was, there ever, was there ever a point in that rough period where you thought, is SnapPick going to make it? Yeah, definitely. Like we were, it was touch and go, especially those first couple of weeks. We were like, I don't, what are we going to do? Yeah. If there's no events for the next like year or two there's there's no way we can that's what i'm saying like with those those costs and stuff we couldn't sustain that for very long so um thankfully it kind of just started to take up a little bit of the virtual and all of that and that just kind of only just just got us through so so how do you feel now like do you feel like relieved <laughs> re- relieved do you feel like because uh, honestly having the show and seeing people like I'm kind of surprised at how resilient the industry was. Yeah. If this didn't knock the industry out like two years of like no work, there's a, there's a little bit of confidence now. Like, hey, if we could go through that, exactly. there's nothing that could knock us down. Exactly. I think early on we were like, we didn't even think Snapic or, you know, kind of this business would have like a lot of sustainability for 10, 20, you know, be one of those like really long lived companies. We thought, you know, a couple years, let's see what, how it goes. And, I, I, you know, like to your point, um, I think if it could withstand COVID, I think it's it's going to be many years, you know, that this industry will be around and that we can pr- hopefully provide, you know, great software. Um, yeah. And then I think when, when, I, th- when I think of uh, those kind of challenges, my thought is always like, there's a great team behind it. That's why you make it. It's not just Julio. There's, I've had the pleasure, I think, of meeting all the co-founders or having yeah. a chat with them. Can you talk a little bit about the team and the their role in making it, making it so that you're still here. You yeah, know? so I, I can't say in, enough about like Marco, Ray, and Rose. Um, obviously, Rose is my wife, so I definitely you have to. Can't, <laughs> can't speak bad about her. But she's been like incredible. I think just in terms of standalone, not being my wife, like she's an incredible um, like business partner. Um, you know, the work ethic's incredible, and she's just. She's just amazing. Uh, Marco and Ray are just like phenomenal. Um, I've I've done business with like kind of friends and stuff in the past, and had um like family members um, that are. And I actually have like a really close. I didn't even touch on that with the entrepreneur side, but I got a family member who's also very close. He's kind of like an uncle, and he's also an entrepreneur, started his own business and stuff. Mm. And we've always chatted about not. Um, like getting involved with family and friends and stuff yeah and, and how tricky it is and we kind of experienced it and i think just with marco and ray it's just been completely different we've obviously had 
because because that's the thing marco was a friend mm -hmm. as well and we've all become friends now yep um so it's not just about kind of the business and it's just been amazing we've had arguments obviously but they just incredible as developers and like incredible as people and yeah it's just i can't say enough about yeah people say don't work with friends and family and i don't <laughs> think it's that simple of a rule it's not black yeah. and white it depends on them the personality your personality and i find that if you have a, the right kind of personalities where you can work together i like working with friends and family i think that business brings you closer yeah um obviously you gotta be able to get along um, and it, to me it's ironic that in south africa you know in in, in some corner of the world there's not a lot of entrepreneurs around yeah. you, but you found the four people to make this happen. Yeah. Like, is that luck? Is that destiny? I don't know what it is, but like, what are the odds that you guys were all around each other in this corner of the world and you built this thing? That's crazy. Yeah. I think it's like, it's so important to, uh, with having like friends or family in business. Like you can get people that unfortunately are like lazy and that's where things can get tricky because then you feel like you're doing more work or whatever. I think that's where we've just got like such an amazing balance. But yeah, you know, it doesn't even make sense why we in this position. But you know, like so grateful, and like we're obviously going to continue to, you know, give as much as we can back to like to our photo booth community, and like hopefully build up businesses because that's actually something that's like incredible for us. You know, when we have a user that says, you know, I started my business and I was you know not making money, and now I'm doing like six figures or whatever and I can I mean someone mailed us and said um you know we said are oh, you going to be at the show and they said no we're actually like in the Bahamas or something <laughs> thanks to Snapic wow. and like that's incredible for us like it's yeah. not just about the, I know everyone says that but it isn't it's not just yeah. about it's about also about like helping others and making sure you know you can enrich other people's lives because yeah that's, that's I suppose that's important hopefully well. the thing like Marco and Ray the developers behind the scenes you know you don't see that but there's literally thousands of people running businesses, supporting their families, yeah, exactly. enjoy, enjoying parties because of the work they do. Yeah. And I hope that like the developers behind the scenes get a taste of that because a lot of times they don't and they're just punching code in, right? But it's real what they're yeah. doing. Um, a lot of entrepreneurs that I talk to, and I think we were talking about this behind the scenes before, uh, it seems like you kind of f fall into it like it seems like you, you kind of fell into the snap it, yeah. it kind of pulled you um how much would you attribute this all to luck destiny or how much was it like i did this i think a lot of life is is luck um you know maybe destiny um but it, obviously it's a lot of hard work and and that's kind of i think something that needs to be like driven home that my friend always used to use like the golfing saying um you know the the more you practice, the luckier you get. Mm. So I think, you know, the more you try at it, the more avenues you, you try that you don't give up, you'll eventually get lucky mm. and like make it. Um, I think it's, you know, you, you go down a road and you hit a, hit a wall and you give up, you know, obviously you're not gonna make it. Like, but if you try, you pivot, try something else, try something else, try something else and, and see what works, then eventually you're gonna get, you're gonna yeah. get lucky. What do the successful boothers do? Is there anything you've learned from analyzing your customer base? Yo, that's a that's a very tricky question. <laughs> um, that's, that's what I'm here for. <laughs> yeah, that is that is a tricky question. Um, like I said, I think it's in, the way that that people or boothers market their product is is the most important thing. Mm -hmm. You know, some people get it in their heads that they need to you know win on price or they need to have ultimate quality and then they'll say to us and obviously now we've integrated dslr but what we, what we'll find is like obviously a lot of um photo boothers were photographers so they like looking at photos and going hey this is just not good enough the quality you the know quality it's all about the quality and and they have that perception in their own minds that this this is not going to sell my customer my client they aren't going to like what i'm giving them and they have almost this block then and then they almost project that onto their customer when they're selling and then they lose the sale where as a lot of other, again the successful people are looking at it and going don't worry about that look at the experience we're creating and then you actually end up finding that those people aren't obsessed with the quality they aren't obsessed with every little pixel and it's not crisp enough and it doesn't look 
you know, because yeah. that's, yeah, I think that's the way you need that, to sell. That's such a great point, not just for photo boothing, but I've noticed in general, creative people, like I have friends that are makeup artists, hairstylists, they think it has to be perfect, the quality, the perf- like the, the photo quality for photographers, and they don't like it, you know, they don't like it, it's not good enough, but nobody else notices that. Because yeah. other people at the party are not professional photographers. Other people at the party are not makeup artists. Exactly. They won't spot the things that you spot. Exactly. It, it's more than good enough for most people. Yeah. So I think that that's great advice to focus on selling the experience. Um, anything that you can share on what you think that, like, we went through a lot. You guys have been here for a few years. You tried virtual. You see hybrid. We're finally back at the expo. You had a chance to talk to a lot of people. What do you see going forward? Um, yes, yeah, so I think for you guys us, when it's a video, you get, you've got some video features that you yeah, released. So we've, we've kind of really focused on creating more ways that our customers can differentiate themselves. So now with, with video, we've built out segmentation, like AI segmentation, so you can separate the foreground and the background and create incredible experiences. Um, and it's so dynamic that there's, I don't know, call it millions of different ways you could create you know, a video effects experience. Um, and I think that will allow our customers to differentiate. And that will be the people that want to take it to the next level and get those corporate clients because they'll be able to provide something unique, right? Mm-hmm. If they go and build it out themselves. And if they want something basic, they can also just choose one of the templates. We're going to be building out a couple hundred templates and they'll just be able to see, you know, click and, so and have that experience. Th- that's something I'm really fascinated by. Like, usually, People get ideas from copying people. Oh, look, oh, they did that at the event. Let's do that too. You're a leader in the industry. Like, there's nobody to copy, right? You have to come up. How do you decide what to do next? Is it something <laughs> like do you, you don't see these things elsewhere? Yeah. People need, like, where does the inspiration come from? Does the client tell you, hey, Julio, can you make me some video effects? Uh, do you think of that yourself because you see it in a different industry? Where does that inspiration for new ideas come from? Um, I think for us, it's always been about, we've, we've obviously got a, a, a lot of creativity in our team, but I think it does come from our users and it comes from more providing them with a tool. So we, we look at it like we need to provide something where they can be creative mm. as opposed to us creating these things that's kind of i think where we you, you kind of focus yeah you give them the toolbox let them play yeah, exactly see what they're doing and just kind of keep exactly. feeding that right and then we draw from that so they'll give us feedback mm. and say oh but it'll be cool to do this and then we'll be like okay well i'm pretty sure we can do that let's discuss with the team and then we adapt it and add different things and i think that's why video fix is being that's been so successful is that we now have the opportunity because of the way we built it we built we, we had that in mind. Mm. We built kind of a, a baseline of what we thought we need, but with provisioning like, okay, we're going to need ways to add these things on. So we kind of built it in a way that we could just add things into video um, mm. just to, you know, make it better. So you give them, so you're really listening to the customer base, right? You saw that you gave them the base for virtual, the data wasn't there, you give them the base for video, you see that it's working and you just want to kind of, uh, feed that fire, um, exactly. see what they're doing and try to improve what, whatever whatever they're using. Okay, that's interesting to know. Um, so what I'm curious to hear about too is because we've talked a lot about um, where you come from in South Africa and I'm always <laughs> fascinated by entrepreneurs because uh, I've got family in other countries and there's not a lot of opportunity in those countries. And I see my family and friends don't have that entrepreneur mindset because there's nothing there. So they, they just kind of go through life. There's no opportunity. There's no jobs. It is what it is. Just get by, get, get through the day. How are you in that kind of environment? And maybe you can describe the environment you grew up in. How in that kind of environment do you have the entrepreneurial mindset from a young age to do these booth events, to do the bar thing? I, ima- I imagine that's not normal. Like most people around you probably weren't like that. Where does that come from? Yeah, I think the entrepreneurial like or like startup kind of spirit isn't, super strong in south africa um so yeah it is it's a bit strange i mean i don't know how it happened i mean i'd love to know if it's because i mean my parents are not like entrepreneurs so it's not like i followed in like their footsteps um so it's strange i just kind of was always that way inclined like i was in high school just you know kind of hustling trying to sell whatever i could or you know start businesses i was still in in 
as we call it, like, I don't know, university, varsity, I don't know, college, whatever. College, yeah. <laughs> but like, yeah, so we were still there just trying to start a, a business. And I, I kind of just always had it in my mind, like, I'm not going to go work for someone. I don't know why, I don't know what caused that or... Um, that's that's so interesting. Like, yeah, did you not, did you need money or did you like? So what? I mean, look, I was never rich growing up. I went to a really good school um, in South Africa. Myself and Marco were at the same school, um, Saint Benedict's, um, in the town that I live, Bedford View, in Johannesburg. Um, and yeah, it was a really good school. But like, my parents didn't have a lot of money. Like, my parents worked basically to put my brother and myself like through school. That was like. <laughs> There was that was my dad's goal like just get him into a good school so obviously we could do well you know yeah um so i was by no means rich but i was also by no means poor um so I had a good background but again no idea why we decided to be like entrepreneurs or what it was it was just kind of always what i wanted to do um are you the only one of your friends like your brother other people yeah they no, didn't end up just yeah kind of not work. entrepreneurs that's so interesting and yeah it's hard to find a find out why where that came from i know it is it's yeah. super interesting especially when you're coming from like it's different if you're in new york city there's entrepreneurs everywhere yeah. you get inspiration uh like i have friends like i said in other countries that there's no there's nobody in town to get inspiration from but nowadays you've got podcasts you've got videos um you can learn from the smartest people in the world no matter where you are yeah the strange thing is actually um I don't know if you know Justin, I think it's Tan. He started Twitch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he had Justin. Justin Can. Justin Can, yeah. 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 Justin, and he had Justin TV. Yes. And for some reason, I don't know how I found it, but I, I used to sit on my bed. I remember going like in high school, just watching Shark Tank on Justin TV. Mm. And I think like, and I've loved, I've watched every single season of Shark Tank. I don't know if that had is some that, bearing. Is that like your first exposure to entrepreneurship? Um, no. So like my, my godfather, um, he was, he was an entrepreneur and like he, I think potentially that came from him as well. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, he, he was really successful. Um, and yeah, and unfortunately he like took his own life, um, so that kind of also opened my eyes to the stresses and yeah. like what this life does to like mental health and it's not easy um so justin can actually speaks a lot about it yeah. um yep so yeah this and i mean even like elon musk and all the big guys they always say like it's it's one thing being that uber super successful because i mean we obviously nowhere near that and we <laughs> feel the stresses but they always speak about like Elon always says, like, nobody would want my mind. Yeah. Like, it's constantly going. I don't ever rest. And you, Did you see the Joe Rogan interview he did yeah. where he asked him, like, what is it like? And he's like, honestly, I don't think anyone would want to be in exactly. that position. It's not fun. Yeah. You know, so there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of pressure. Um, it looks nice. You know, they got all yeah. this money. But um, there's definitely a mental toll that it takes. Um, I feel the same way. Sometimes I can't turn my mind off. Like, there's yeah, too many things. Exactly. Imagine running those kind of corporations yeah um, sometimes i kind of just wish i would i was more the kind of like my brother yeah. is he's so happy and he just yeah. you know he does his nine to five and he's got it like a family and he lives up in leeds and he's just happy and sometimes i'm just like i wish yeah. <laughs> i wish i was kind of more same you know, i've got just, a friend <laughs> i've got a friend and he's like all i need to be happy is yeah. my cigarette <laughs> and my coffee i'm good and yeah i just exactly. can't relate to that you know yeah. so is there any other ambitions you have um anything like speaking on this topic that we should be slowing down and taking it in general. What else do you want to do? <laughs> yeah, no, so look, I mean, I think COVID changed things a bit. I also want to start a family and I, I, I had this dream to be, you know, a millionaire, billionaire, whatever. That was always what I had growing up. Um, and I just think, you know, I think COVID changed things for me. I, I kind of do want to, you know, have a family and enjoy life a little bit more than yeah. just the stresses of, of business. It's funny as you, you're, you're young, you don't know better. It's like, oh, I gotta be a billionaire. <laughs> but as you get older, you realize you don't need that yeah, kind exactly. of money to live the kind of life you want. Uh, there's more important things. Um, so awesome, Julio. Thank you so much. Pleasure chatting with you. Yeah, really good chatting. Thank you.